Welcome to Feminist Buzzkills, the show that couldn't get Sydney Sweeney to do our opening monologue. Mm. Ugh, damn. I'm Moji Alwariel, and while Liz is still on vacation, I'm joined by my co-host, Alyssa Alduki. Hey, Moji. So nice to be here once again. Uh-huh. This is going to be a fun one for my last vacation series episodes. We're releasing this episode on International Women's Day. So all you listeners out there, do your part and celebrate women by leaving them the hell alone today. Oh, fuck yeah. Yeah. That's what anybody wants, really, truly. I'm also so glad to be here because on this special episode, we are celebrating Abortion Provider Appreciation Week. Yay! Yay! We love abortion providers. Fuck yeah. (laughs) Even before the Dobbs decision, independent abortion clinics who provide the majority of abortion care in the U.S. were dwindling in numbers. Today, we're going to talk about some of the unique dangers that independent providers face and highlight why we need at least a week to celebrate the people who do this work. Helping us love on the folks who make abortion happen are Melissa Grant, Chief Operations Officer and Co-Founder of FemHealth USA and the CareFem Clinics. And to tell us about how we as an org celebrate abortion providers, we have AAF's own Programs Director, Kristen Haiti. Oh, it's going to be so good. So good. Before we get to that, what's on your mind this week, Dukes? Okay, besides abortion providers and women, all I can think about is love is blind. I don't know if I'm watching that. What? Yeah, I'm obsessed with reality TV. And the finale of Love is Blind was on last night, and it, which is a whole thing in its own right. But the big story out of this season of Love is Blind is that there's this couple, Johnny and Amy. They're everybody's favorite. Like, they're clearly the ones who actually like each other the most, and they're not in it just to not lose money or whatever the consequences are for going on the show but they have this whole storyline of struggling to figure out birth control (laughs) okay okay so dukes i i watched the first season of love is blind and was in the presence of like the last few episodes of the last season so you have to bring me up to speed because i don't remember any reality show i've ever watched ever talking about birth control so what yeah no this is like a a seeps plot of the storyline it's like the only thing they have that they can't agree on is birth control. So uh, Johnny goes to Amy and he says, I assumed that all women were on birth control by default. What? Yeah. Like they hand it out when you start menstruating, they're like, here's your birth control. I think he thinks it just populates in your blood when it's time. (laughs) It's just birth control just naturally dispenses out of your body when the time is right. But Amy does want to go on birth control because I I did a little research and she just doesn't want to go on birth control. She's just not going to work out for her. And she suggests he get a vasectomy. Not a bad plan. That's not a bad plan. Is he from Alabama? Had he heard of vasectomies? What's going on? <laughs> the the whole thing, I think, it does take place in the South, I think. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I think the thing that's really missing from this conversation is condoms. <laughs> <laughs> what? That's the thing when you said birth control and I'm like, okay, yeah, condoms. But no, he's not talking about condoms. He's no. talking about like hormonal birth control. He's talking about like a pill or an IUD or... Any of these things that also, I just want to say, don't protect you from STIs. Right. Which is one of the things one has a concern when starting a new sexual relationship with someone you don't really know. Have they talked about any testing for STIs at all? No, they never talked about testing for STIs. Uh, They just saw what each other looks like for the first time, like two weeks ago. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) That was one of my other questions. Did they do this like before they saw each other? Were they doing this like in the separate rooms, just talking like, tell me about your uh, IUD? You know, I think they did have a conversation about birth control in in the pods, as they call it. Um, But it really came to a head because they approached their wedding day and had not had sex yet. According to Amy. Because he has a latex allergy? I wish I knew if he had a latex allergy, but condoms just kept coming. It was like, forget plan B, they're on plan X and they have to walk it back now. Like They can't, They just cannot get the handle of birth control. <laughs> God, maybe they should um, take mifepristone. I was going to say they could just listen to Dr. Gompertz from last week and use mifepristone, I guess. That's still not going to protect them from STIs. I don't know. Maybe because I'm a woman of the 90s who came to my sexual awakening in the 90s when like, that's what they were teaching us. Protect yourself from STIs. This man won't have sex with his wife. I think he's safe from sexually transmitted infections (laughs) because he's too scared to get her pregnant. (laughs) I mean, I guess if you're in the Carolinas, pregnancy is a real concern that you just would be stuck with. It is a real concern. She doesn't want to have to deal with that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. 
I mean, if the conversation keeps going in this direction, they'll need an abortion provider sooner rather than later anyway. <laughs> Which is a great transition to our first guest. And since we're dedicating today's episode to appreciating abortion providers, we got someone here at AAF who helps us do that year round. She's the programs director here at Abortion Access Front and a fierce Midwesterner. Please welcome Kristen Haiti. Hi, Kristen. Hey, Kristen. Hi, everybody. I love seeing your faces. It's always so great. Thanks for joining us today on the pod. So we wanted you to come on today to talk about the importance of Abortion Providers Appreciation Week. Can you tell our listeners uh, when it started and why it is necessary? This week is a really great opportunity to shower love on providers everywhere, but it's really important to remember why it came about. And Abortion Provider Appreciation Day was enacted in 1996 in response to the murder of a clinic provider, Dr. David Gunn in Pensacola, Florida. And it's really a time where we do celebrate and and appreciate all of the work that they do. But this movement has a history and it's important to acknowledge it and make sure that we learn from it and don't repeat it. Kristen, when you say history, do you mean the history of the anti-abortion movement attacking and vilifying providers? Or are you thinking about the history of our movement of supporters not necessarily celebrating our providers the way we should? Absolutely. I would say it's both of them. I think both are really applicable to this. The the violent history of the abortion movement is absolutely anti-abortion extremists attacking abortion and abortion providers. Until now, we've had about 11 murders, dozens of bombings, hundreds of arsons, assaults, clinic invasions, and burglaries. And that all still happens, but it's a history that we all have to pay attention to. And for our own movement, you're absolutely right. We have to learn to celebrate the things that work, to celebrate the people on the ground doing the work and doing the job that we all believe in because it can be really miserable sometimes and they need some extra special love. Yeah, yeah. So in the face of, you know, this really necessary and important job and the barriers that abortion providers face, what do providers need from their communities? What can we do? Abortion providers really vary so much from clinic to clinic and region to region. And so a lot of these answers are unique to the clinic. So one, we'll always tell folks if they want to get involved, send an email to the clinic. Don't call their patient line. Don't call their nurse line. Pay attention to what you're doing and ask what kind of support they need. But some of the things we've helped participate in and organize over the years, gratitude, which is exactly what this week is all about. One thing that AAF does is we have what we call thank bank postcards, which are these gorgeous postcards with beautiful messages to providers. And we send out thousands of postcards a year, often signed by people from all across the country. And it's really lovely to read through those messages. Being aware of the clinic and their needs in your community is huge, whether that's legislatively, maybe they have clinic escorts or clinic defenders, and you can volunteer your time to walk patients in and out of the clinic. Is there an abortion fund that supports the clinic near you or a clinic that you care about? Being able to fundraise for them, volunteer. The abortion community is really so interconnected that when we help one part, it helps the rest. When we help abortion funds, it helps clinics who help patients. When we help clinics, we help our communities because people are able to lead the lives that they want. There's plenty of work that's already being done. And so really taking some time to look into who is doing it, your local organizations, your local advocacy groups and activists, plug into the work that they're doing and it will open so much more for you because this community is really beautiful and expansive and it's a privilege to be a part of. I feel like you listed so many great options of things that people can do and ways that they can really kind of support their clinics. What are some of the kind of things that supportive, well-meaning people do that is not helpful? It really comes down to showing up uninvited in, you know, a myriad of ways, but really mm. 
When you work at an abortion clinic, you expect that there are going to be protesters. There are going to be people on your sidewalks. And you also, again, know the history of the abortion movement and anti-abortion violence. And even if you've never experienced something like that, it is a part of what you do. When someone shows up to the clinic that is unknown to clinic staff or volunteers, you are another threat to that clinic. They don't know your motives. They don't know why you're there. So even if you are supportive and you are there for all of the right reasons, always check with clinics. Because even if you have this great sign all about your pro-abortion or don't listen to these assholes and you think you're being really helpful, you are still one more person on a sidewalk who's inserting themselves into another person's medical business and their care. And we should really avoid that at all costs. We don't want to put more barriers. We don't want to put more obstacles in front of people trying to just trying to get an abortion. So really just don't show up where you're not wanted and make sure that whatever you're doing is centering what's important. And that is abortion access and abortion seekers, the actual human people that are going and have lives. And this is not when they're going there, a political movement or a soapbox. It's just something that they are doing. And that has to be at the crux of what we do and why you do it. And to reiterate something you said earlier, there are people already doing the work that you can plug into. Don't go in there being a vigilante is what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they're all tired and worn out because it's exhausting and they can probably use a nap. So if you plugged in and took some of those hours, they could go get a nap. And that is a really wild concept. And especially because, like we were saying earlier, you know, there are some real dangers that providers face. And you kind of went through some of them. But what other things have you experienced? Because I know you're on the ground a lot. Have you experienced or seen in your time protecting clinics? Yeah, I've had my children called out by name by protesters. That is personal. It was one of the few times where I'm like, all right maybe I'll catch a charge. (laughs) I mean, it's your kids. What are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? I did not, in fact, catch a charge. So I applaud your restraint. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So tell us the story. Like, tell us, tell us about something particularly egregious that you know of or you experienced just trying to do some clinic defense or are people you work with clinics are plugged in to, because I know we have a few, but pick something that people might enjoy hearing about. I think Depending on egregious, you see a a lot of wild things out on the sidewalks um, at clinics. Just no day is the same. But I will say we have a sister clinic in Ohio, um, Northeast Ohio Women's Center, where, you know, it feels strange to utter this sentence out loud, but they did have a woman come up and throw eggs at the clinic and then go pick up raccoon roadkill bring it back to the clinic and throw it at the escorts in the clinic a a dead raccoon she picked it up from the street yeah (laughs) and then threw it at human beings yeah indeed in in you know oddly enough when the clinic escorts saw a woman walking towards them with a raccoon carcass they did seem to go inside the clinic so at least it only hit the building um you i mean a person walking at me with a dead raccoon would give me pause in any situation yeah i feel like that's warranted (laughs) yeah you kind of have to assume i could be on the receiving end of this raccoon carcass And don't want to be. Yeah. A question we all ask ourselves, what to do when faced with the raccoon carcass? You also mentioned that you're in Ohio. And I do remember years ago hearing this story um, from Liz, who's not here today, about an activist, an anti-abortion activist in Ohio who would just go through trash at clinics to find uh, evidence. And I put that in quote, to use against clinics and providers. Yeah, it's it's an incredibly common tactic at abortion clinics, which which is why almost exclusively if you ever go to a clinic and they have a dumpster, it is going to be locked because they will have people go in and dumpster dive and try to find evidence. You know, in Ohio, there was one particular Ohio rep who ran a fake clinic who claimed that 
a dog must have gone into the dumpster of the local abortion clinic, taken out a fetus, and somehow managed to homeward bound the fetus back to her, and she just knew what it was. That's Ohio. <laughs> How do you train the fetal canine unit is what I want to know. <laughs> what are they sniffing to get the scent? That's not a thing. It's not a thing. And that's just so like terrifying to think of like you're going to work, you know, as a provider or someone who works at a clinic. And this is the kind of thing you have to deal with on top of doing your job. And so, you know, like we've said, these are, these are the things that providers are facing every day and we want to appreciate them. So, you know, we celebrate providers year round here at AAF and you as director of programs, you're like the queen of celebrating abortion mm -hmm. providers. So what does AAF and by extension, what does a director of programs do at Abortion Access Front to help those providers? Great question. What do I do at Abortion Access Front? I ask myself <laughs> that every day. And I do love that it often boils down to clinic support. That is why we are here. That is mm -hmm. why we do this work is to show up. And the way we do that is, and this is revolutionary, we ask what they need. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I know. I know. I know. What a concept. Huh. You know, we weren't sure about it, but it has seemed <laughs> to work out so far. Those requests, they're all different things. Sometimes they, you know, maybe they'll need furniture put together or a clinic painted or volunteers or some translation requests. I always like to tell clinics that I can't guarantee we can do anything, but I want to try and I'd love the chance to do it. You know, some of the things we do all the time is we have this program called Adopt-A-Clinic, which is featured heavily on everything this week. And it is so simple and so perfect where clinics and escort and defender groups and abortion funds just tell you what they want. They put it on an Amazon wish list and you go and buy it. It's the American most favorite way of activism is to buy something while we are sitting on the couch for somebody else. And everybody loves it. Oh. Yeah, it's we've had so fun perfect. doing abortion provider bingo on socials this week. So if you haven't cleared the board, now's your chance. <laughs> yes, please do. And also we're working on, I have one Amazon wish list that has thousands of gift cards. Because you know what? We just, we want to shower providers all year round. We want them to know they're loved. Maybe they've had a tough week. Let's send them a couple of movie passes. Maybe um, we're just thinking about how much we love them and those little hearts are floating off the top of our heads and we just want to send them gift cards just because. We want to just Scrooge McDuck our way through all of these gift cards and make sure <laughs> our providers, like, they know we love them and almost a little too much. Maybe you guys need to leave us alone. I love that. That is actually one of the best things about doing this job. I mean, this podcast is a gas, but knowing that we're supporting providers and in this way is just one of the more inspiring parts of the work that we do. And I love that you are leading us in that charge, Kristen. It feels so good. I feel very lucky to be able to do it because that is the movement sustaining work. When you just get to do something for somebody else, that's it. Because you should, and we all should. And I love that we get to be a part of that. And we are pleading with everyone. Get on board. Check out our Amazon wish list. Check out socials and find all the ways you can help clear the board, as Alyssa said. And you can get in on this abortion provider appreciation love that we are doing. Woohoo! Thanks so much for coming on the podcast, Kristen, and telling everybody what they can do to appreciate providers this week and all year round. Thanks for having me. Love you guys. Love you, Kristen. Love you, Kristen. Now it's time for a steaming dump of this week's abortion news. First up, in the face of extreme backlash after the Alabama IVF ruling, many anti-abortion states are at least temporarily backing off their relentless push to give full rights to Petri Patch kids. But not Tennessee. They just blocked a bill that would have protected IVF in the state. Seems they didn't get the memo to not announce that they plan on destroying every single form of reproductive options available. But don't worry, Alyssa, they said that they don't need that protection because there's no immediate threat to IVF in Tennessee. Yeah, Alabama said that too. Mm -hmm. So 
While the rest of the South is at least noticing they're in a burning building, Tennessee is just breaking out the s'mores and roasting marshmallows. (laughs) Next up, this is charming. Nebraska has an amazing constitutional requirement for people with ADHD like me and I think most of us that Mm -hmm. says bills can't contain more than one subject because more than one thing is just distracting, you know? Well, Nebraska lawmakers violated that requirement pretty brazenly when they took an already heinous bill restricting care for trans youth and tacked on a 12-week abortion ban for bad measure. And then they passed it. These guys think they're slick, but it's not like adding an extra delivery fee on your Uber Eats order. It's adding a forced delivery requirement. And yeah, we fucking noticed. And finally, marches for Mifepristone. This month, CVS and Walgreens are finally going to make the abortion pill available in their pharmacies, but only in the handful of states that Ben Affleck gets his Duncan from, like Massachusetts, New York, and California. Experts are saying we should expect to see anti-abortion protesters on the corner of happy and healthy. This has been your steaming news dump. Come back next week to get caught up on all the crap. All right, Moji, let's get to the abortion provider appreciating and our big stories of the day. All right. So the unexpected death of the clinic director at Bronx Abortion caused immediate closure of the independent clinic, leaving 1.4 million people with less health care choices. Now there's only one clinic remaining in the Bronx and access to abortion just becomes a lot more challenging for New Yorkers. This story was a little challenging for me. Bronx Abortion is a clinic. Again, it doesn't exist any longer, but it opened in 1969. It was a pre-roll clinic and it provided both medication and surgical abortions and really nothing else. And the clinic owner opened it after encountering dying patients. He was a doctor and he would see dying patients in the ER who had basically had illegal and unsafe abortions. Now, this abortion clinic was really great because it was a really a neighborhood good, right? It was one of two independent clinics in the Bronx area. And it was described as easy, fast, and an affordable way to access care. It sounds like it was really a cornerstone of the community. It really seemed like it was. I mean, in the way that abortion clinics can be. Marie, former host of the FBK pod, was a clinic escort there for many years, actually up until its close. And she said that it primarily served local community. But after DOPS, they actually had a lot more people coming from New Jersey and Connecticut and Westchester, which is a local New York suburb. Mm -hmm. So what's really wild about the story is that one woman's death, the clinic director, shuttered all of this good work. Wow. It's terrifying that that's all it took to keep this clinic afloat. And I mean, you know, as we appreciate abortion providers, like it really is a testament to how much work one person has to do. I mean, in any workplace, if one person stops coming in, the whole place doesn't shut down. But that is the reality that a lot of independent abortion clinics face. Yeah. And it sounds like just one story, right? We're talking about Bronx, Mm -hmm. but dozens of independent clinics have actually closed since the 2022 Dobbs decision. But even before that, the U.S. had lost a third of independent clinics since 2012. And independent clinics are the backbone of abortion care in this country. They serve three out of five people who have abortions in this country. And New York is considered an abortion sanctuary state, right? This is one of the places that's lauded as where you can get care. And we're not saying that it's disappeared from the Bronx, but this closure really does cut into access for residents. There's so many things affecting people's ability to access care that leaves independent clinics as the number one source. And that includes the proliferation of Catholic hospitals. These are Mm -hmm. taking over hospital systems everywhere, wherever you are. If you think about it, I'm sure you know a Catholic hospital that recently took over near you. And what that does is stops people from being able to get abortions. There are many states that have laws protecting hospitals that don't want to offer care for religious reasons. And Catholic hospitals will be able to just refuse abortion care. And if they become the primary care facilities, that means no abortions. And in many regions, they are the primary care facility, the only option people have. Another big barrier to abortion care for people and really something that hits abortion clinics hard is the Hyde Amendment. Hold up. Now, the Hyde Amendment is our vocabulary for the week, so let's break it down for you. It's an amendment that was enacted in 1977, and it prohibits federal funds from being used for abortion care except for cases of rape, incest, and to protect the life of the mother. And this basically means that Medicaid, people who use Medicaid, cannot use Medicaid funds to pay for abortion care, even though it can pay for a host of other 
parts of medical care that people would have. And that's money that hospitals can access. But independent clinics, if abortion is primarily what they do, they don't have another funding source to receive money like that. Insurance also often doesn't cover abortion care. And some states write laws that expressly prohibit abortion care from being covered in any state insurance plan. And even when insurance could cover care, navigating that insurance is a whole job. And that's something a large hospital would have the capacity to navigate, but independent clinics are smaller. And like we see in the story, sometimes there's one person holding it all together and that would leave you in a position to not be able to figure that out. It's just one of the like, Independent clinics, while they do abortion care and they provide all this care, they're less resourced than these larger corporations, Mm -hmm. which is what a hospital often is. And the other thing, which we talk about less now because of the Dobbs decision, because at this point, we're just trying to keep clinics open, but they're trap laws, which are targeted regulations for abortion providers. And this is a lot of what has been used to decimate clinic access until the Dobbs decision. And basically, it's legislatures trying to find ways to legislate clinics out of existence. And you hear about these when they're like, oh, we need to make the the hallways wider. We need to make them like ambulatory ready. Mm-hmm. And one that came after Dobbs that I want to talk about is in Utah, where in 2023, they basically passed a law that said only hospitals could do abortion care. The problem was that in Utah, hospitals had done 1% of abortion care in the state, and they didn't have the capacity to do that or the interest, if I'm honest. Anyway, in closing, I just want to say, There was this friendly neighborhood clinic that was a community support, and one woman's death caused the whole thing to break down. But one of the bright sides, one of the good things I heard about it was that after the clinic closed, the escorts would show up uh, weeks after and be there to intercept patients because one of the things this clinic did was they would have walk-ins. So a lot of times you can't get appointments or just people don't have the capacity to make appointments, and you could show up there. So they would be there to intercept people who were just trying to walk in and have the care they needed and direct them to other places where they could get care, direct them away from the antis who were there and sort of celebrating the close of this clinic and also telling them about plan B and other things. And I just, I think it's a testament to like the ways like we talk about providers, but really providers encompasses a large network of people that crop up to help people get the care they need. And that includes funds, escorts, People who actually provide work, obviously support staff at clinics are considered providers. And that part of the story to me was just a a warm end on a really terrible sandwich. I love that we had that personal connection to Bronx abortion and just, again, an incredible story to let our listeners know that you can be one of these abortion supporters as well, part of this network of abortion provider appreciators. <laughs> <laughs> also to like circle back to what Kristen said uh, earlier when we spoke to her, contact your clinic, find out the ways you can support them. Perhaps you have expertise in navigating insurance or something. They may mm-hmm. want that, they may not. But if you want to be a part of helping to prop up your local clinic and help to make sure that that community goods stays in your clinic, be in contact by email and see what ways you can donate your support. Love that. Well, Dukes, why don't you tell us about some of the more direct ways that providers are being attacked? Now that we know how small that network of support can be, when we learn about how big the anti-abortion response to that can be, it it should look really staggering. And and anti-abortion people will do literally anything to undermine providers and waste their time. And this week we saw a glaring example of that come out of Missouri. A video by a shady anti-abortion organization called Project Veritas is being used to fuel a lawsuit against Planned Parenthood filed by Missouri's attorney general. The AG, Andrew Bailey, who you may remember from sucking when it comes to abortion literally every time, (laughs) is accusing the Planned Parenthood affiliate of helping Missouri minors travel to Kansas for abortions without informing their parents, which would be a violation of state law. Oh, yeah, that's that bullshit abortion trafficking law where they create a thing that doesn't exists. Mm -hmm. One of the problems, of course, that videos like this are getting made in the first place, right? But what's even more worrying is this trend of anti-abortion legislators taking this misinformation and using it to justify abortion bans and basically using fake news to make bad law. Right, right. And this isn't the first time, as you said, the Project Veritas has created one of these videos, nor the first time that lawmakers would watch them freak out and make decisions about your health care based on these villainous videos. They've targeted NPR, Medicaid, and so many others. 
And all of these videos are very creatively edited masterpieces of misinformation. And it all started with two videos in 2008 and 2009. Videos the founder recorded with the it girl of the anti-abortion movement, Lila Rose, disguised as a teenager, which is a stretch, if you ask me. It really is a stretch for her. Okay. They post her as 15 and 13. And I just, it seems, it's a stretch. Uh, So they described her as a teenager seeking abortion at a Planned Parenthood. I remember these. This led to a huge, huge, huge witch hunt on the federal level. And the first video got taken down after Lila Rose got a cease and desist because, you know, it turns out you can't do that in California and you Hmm. need two-party consent to record another person. And the second, it was found that they had, what did you call it? Done some creative editing. Yes. Basically misinformation forming. And they had cut out a part where the clinic worker is saying, we have to follow the laws. Basically, they were just like, let's pretend like these people don't know the laws. And turns out the law is you can't fucking record this. <laughs> <laughs> and there was another clip that was edited out where the provider was basically urging Lila Rose, pretending to be a teenager, to chat with her mom about the pregnancy. So their whole gotcha was that they were not asking for consent from the parents. What? And these videos only set the stage for their biggest stunt, which became known as the Planned Parenthood baby parts videos, which creator David Delayden has since admitted were totally edited to suit his own narrative. Their videos exposing other non-abortion organizations also easily debunked. In fact, there's so much bunk, you could see it from outer space. So we really have literally so much intel that this new video from Project Veritas out of Missouri cannot be trusted. So why again, is it immediately taken up by lawmakers to say, look, we can't trust abortion providers and they must be stopped? Well, obviously we know that people are living in their own bias, right? Like if you believe that, I don't know, uh, a lot of bunk that we hear from anti-abortion legislators and politicians and activists, then it's easy for you to believe that people who provide abortions are demons, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you see an edit, you don't even do like, how is this edited? Like what is missing? What is... Why is, why is there a jump cut here? I saw it with my own eyes. We all live in our own biases. And I feel like if you're inclined to be biased, if you believe that like providers are dragging teenagers to clinics to have abortions that they don't want, then it's easy for you to, to just look at an edit that kind of confirms what you expect to see. Yeah. And that's what makes it so insidious and so scary that even though there's so much evidence that this is hooey, they're still being used and they're still being believed even after... Uh, they all go through these lawsuits where they get taken down for misinformation. People are still watching them. Project Veritas, these are also the same guys who use location data to target visitors at 600 Planned Parenthood locations and send them targeted ads about not ending their pregnancy. Like they are getting it in on all Fronts. And they got that information without consent and are trying to sell it without consent, which is also really Correct. terrifying when you think about the pri- privacy implications of that. It's an all around assault on people managing their pregnancy outcomes. And, you know, you hear about like how huge this assault is. And one thing that I hear from abortion providers over and over and over again is I wasn't prepared to be a media personality, a legal expert. I didn't expect to speak in front of Congress. I just wanted to provide people with the health care they need. And when people release these videos full of misinformation that people believe, even though they're crap, It leads to these investigations, lawsuits, and lawmaking, and all of that interferes with providers doing their job. And just to circle briefly back to my story from before, if they are trying to do their job and they're already overwhelmed and you add on having to be a media personality, a legal expert, speak in front of Congress, like that is a lot to ask an already taxed person to have to take on just to do work that they believe in to support their community. Just like with women, support an abortion provider today. Leave them the hell alone and let them do their jobs. As always, these stories will be in the show notes and you can find the best, most up-to-the-minute resources in accessing abortion care and funding your care on our website, aafront.org. Our Charlie chatbot on the bottom right will walk anyone, anywhere in the country through their options and resources for abortion. Alyssa, we had another great conversation today. Can you talk about our other guest? Yes, please. Our next guest is Chief Operations Officer and co-founder of Fem Health USA and Care Fem Clinics. Please welcome Melissa Grant. Hi, Melissa. Welcome, Melissa. Hello. Glad to be here. 
so excited to have you. Thank you so much for joining us on this Abortion Provider Appreciation Day episode. So we've got to start off and ask you, how did you get your start in abortion care? I have been working in abortion care for over 30 years. My mother is actually an advanced practice nurse. My stepdad is an OBGYN physician. And I knew from the time I was very, very young that reproductive health care and abortion care were okay, that they were part of my life. I understood them to be an important part of many people's lives. And so when I was just coming out of my undergraduate degree in college, I started working for Planned Parenthood. And that was over 30 years ago and been a few places since but each day continues to change, particularly in the last few. <laughs> what doesn't change is my commitment to making sure that people have access to abortion care. You're an abortion Nepo baby. I love yes. that for you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Multi-generational. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say, oh, there's no way you could have escaped it. I love that. <laughs> um, now, currently you're at Carafin. So can you tell our listeners what Carafin does and what you do there? Absolutely. I co-founded CARFM in the year 2013. CARFM is a leader in providing medically supported at-home abortion care in 16 states and in brick and mortar health centers in three states. So we provide safe, affordable, and efficient abortion care that's really tailored to the need of the individual. We also provide birth control, sexually transmitted infection testing and treatment, and supportive services around repro and sexual health care. I know you guys expanded nationally since 2022. And can you tell me, like, how does your expansion handle working with patients and clinics in restrictive or severely restricted states? We've actually been growing since inception. So about every two years, we would grow, whether it was a brick and mortar health center or adding services. And that has exploded, certainly, since the time that telehealth and medication abortion has been deregulated in the U.S., we started our health centers in Washington, D.C., but quickly moved and built in Atlanta, Georgia, and in Nashville, Tennessee, and then followed up in the Chicago metro area in order to serve people in surrounding states that had really harsh abortion restrictions. The thing that's changed the most for us, in addition to the ability of expanding telehealth abortion care, has been the unnecessary complete closure of our health center in Nashville, Tennessee, because of the restricting environment there, and also, unfortunately, limiting abortion care in Atlanta, Georgia, to six weeks, which is oftentimes before the people who come to us even had an idea they were pregnant. Yeah, that's what a six-week ban does, because people rarely know. You have to be really diligent in taking pregnancy tests for funsies to know around six weeks, generally. People don't realize that you miss your period at four weeks. Right. That gives you two weeks right. from a time of a missed period to determine what's going on with you. If you have irregular cycles, that may not be possible. Get a pregnancy test and even just sit with the ideas, is this real? Who do I want to talk to about it? Besides jumping right into action. I was watching on the, on one of the social medias I love someone who was having a wanted pregnancy and seemed to be going on with a pregnancy they were excited about. And they were like, I'm taking pregnancy tests every day. I'm just unclear what's happening in surprise. And they were, yeah, just sitting with it. It's it's a powerful moment. We do sit with many people and the anxiety right now and the fear in many places around the U.S. around this decrease in abortion care has led people to test even more. So yes, people who want to be pregnant, oftentimes will have tests all around their house. But now people who don't want to be pregnant oftentimes are buying huge amounts of pregnancy tests and maybe taking them daily. So the image of a person sitting at their sink with pregnancy tests lined up is not necessarily unusual right now. Wow. Yeah, you know, in this conversation about accessibility and the way CARFM has had to kind of grow and change over the last four years, but especially the last two, like, what do you think the public needs to know about accessing abortion via telehealth? Well, since its inception, CARFM really was moving to deliver abortion in a care that was different. We mm -hmm. really wanted to be client-centered and shape the way that the client wanted to receive their care. Well, now, unfortunately, even more so, we've had to change to be able to provide care in the way that some people can access it at all. So I want to preface this by saying that telehealth is a great option and it has expanded the access for many people, but it is not the option that everyone wants to choose. It's just easier for some people because you don't have to travel as far. You don't have to spend as long in a clinic. It's more easily set up at various locations across our country. Um, and now people can self-manage abortion by oftentimes ordering it and bringing it into a state where it's been banned. 
Abortion with medication is safe. Abortion with medication is relatively easy to procure. It's less expensive. However, it's still painful. It's still an abortion. And it does need for many people the opportunity to get fast answers that they trust. That's the part that's a little bit harder right now in our country for many, many people. When you say fast answers by people you you trust, you mean just sort of like, I'm sitting here, things are happening, I may have never done this before, what's next? That's right. One of the things that CareFem has tried to do to make information more available is to integrate technology. And so one of the things we've worked toward is having answers that are programmed into a virtual assistant. So that you can text us 24-7 if you're having an abortion with CARIFM and get a real-time answer. And if we haven't programmed the answer, it'll bring on one of my staff to give you that answer. But the thing is, if you're receiving this care at home and your service doesn't offer that, which can happen, people take this medicine sometimes on the holidays. People take this medication in the middle of the night. Your body doesn't respond to the eight to five clock. And so it's normal to have questions. And now that so many places have banned this option in terms of abortion in general in states, the anxiety is even higher for a lot of people, which oftentimes leads to more questions. So that's one of the things that's so hard. People should be able to have reasonable access to evidence-based information that's non-shameful, that's clear. It's supportive. It should be supportive. People should feel like there's somebody there for them, a healthcare provider that can hold their hand, whether it's, you know, literally or figuratively. That's been challenged by these bands. That's one thing in the in the conversations that Dukes and I and Liz and I have with people, especially who've been harmed by these bands, that seems to be one of the most terrifying things is that doctors feel like they, if, if they are in whatever reason, have some capacity to have actual care with doctors, doctors feel like they can't say things that are useful information for a patient to have and are just left for people to follow breadcrumbs or get inference rather than real health care. So it sounds really great that you have this bot or this chat that people can get some answers from. Well, people prefer in large to ask medical questions around things that feel embarrassing through text when they can <laughs> instead of in person. We learned that a long time ago, actually. <laughs> so offering that opportunity for people just to ask any quick question has been very successful. We actually took over our one millionth text from a client. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's real. This 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 happens. But the key to this is providing information in banned states should still be legal. The idea that providing information would be questionable in our country with free speech laws is mind blowing. Mm -hmm. Those of us who are working in environments where we've not been shut down, where it's still legal, are trying to provide more and more education in different ways. Some of that is through shows like yours. Thank you very much. Uh, some of it through social media and then looking for things like technology that can close that gap. So for instance, we certainly served people at CAREFM now 24 seven, seven days a week because we can offer telemedicine, give fast responses no matter when you need the care. And that's helped a little bit. Are there any ways, speaking specifically post the Dobbs decision of 2022 that you haven't mentioned that giving abortion care has changed for CAREFM that maybe surprised you? Well, I think first of all, the decision to seek abortion care can be really complex. And at its heart, sometimes it can feel disempowering because people feel stigma and shame around the idea that an abortion is acceptable to talk about. And since Dobbs, unfortunately, I think that's grown, that because of that fear that illegal must mean unsafe or illegal must mean shameful, I think it's put this chilling effect on the ability for people to ask questions and to some degree has really influenced people who are providing care about to be very cautious about what they feel they can say and, and rightly so in some of these states. And so how do you overcome that? Um, particularly when people are so afraid they, they resort to words like going camping instead of having an abortion. And so some of the ways that we feel we can do that is to one, have a very strong unapologetic public presence to say, yes, we do abortions. Yes, you deserve access to a quality abortion. You deserve the opportunity to ask questions, to feel empowered, and to feel like you can make the decision that's best for yourself. So sometimes that means thinking more about what that next question is, anticipating and trying to put those answers out into the public arena. 
And social media has helped with that. It's just disappointing that when we've been trying for so many years to do this and to move forward, that these legal changes feel like they've shoved so many people backwards. Yeah, you've been trying for 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> Not alone. There are people a lot longer than me. Yeah, oh, I know. Yeah. But so just to go back to what Duke said in the beginning, we are this episode celebrating abortion providers appreciation day. And this is a day to celebrate abortion providers. And it's a day that started after the murder of Dr. David Gunn, an abortion provider who was murdered in um, Florida in 1993, I believe. And so your clinic offices in Tennessee were invaded by 11 people in the last few years who fortunately were recently indicted using the FACE Act, the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act, which is a federal act that is basically came into fruition after the murder of Dr. Gunn. Can you talk about the experience as a provider of having hostile people come into your clinic while you're trying to provide services to people who need help? To be clear, it's been more than 11 people. There were just the 11 people that actually were successfully indicted and will hopefully be sentenced this coming July. The key with this in areas, particularly of the U.S., where the state has been hostile to abortion care providers, has been oftentimes clinics are surrounded with people who are voicing their disapproval of your providing care. That isn't just saying they don't like it. This is actively blocking people from clinic entrances. These people sat in front of our door. They came in our building, which is a multi-story, multi-use medical facility, and sat on the floor in front of our door and refused to move for several hours. This wasn't just peacefully protesting. This was blocking the ability for my staff to come in and go out, for patients to come in and go out. That's wrong. No business in the United States can be shut down in the same way that abortion providers have been shut down regularly over the last 20 years. But now, just recently, it does give us some hope that this federal law, which should provide opportunities for people to access this legal service, no longer legal in Tennessee, by the way, which in some ways isn't surprising. I hope that can change. It shouldn't be that way for any business. And it wasn't just us. Our neighbors in that office were impacted. The entire block was shut down with the number of protesters outside our business. Mm -hmm. We were watching the stream on Facebook because they were streaming it as they did it. They were brazen. They do this gleefully. And and like you said, you know, you're now able to provide 24-7 services. It feels like these guys are 24-7 outside, never quitting, making sure that people can't access care. Well, thankfully, it's not quite that. Uh, you'll find that there are circumstances that dissuaded them fairly easily, bad weather, low <laughs> senses, uh, things that they would leave. But ultimately, that's not what, it, what this is really about. This is about trying to gain public support and oftentimes money for a political cause and doing it by exploiting uh, the needs of real people, oftentimes, again, low-income, vulnerable people who've decided to seek health care. And this is wrong. This is one reason why legally, I believe this country is moving uh, in some circles to try to shut down things that make abortion more accessible, like telehealth, because it's deeply frightening to them. How do you block the doorway to something that's virtual? And that's really the key of what's happening right now. That's why they want to shut it down. Yeah, there really is. Like, how do you block the doorway to someone's mailbox? That's right. Mm -hmm. That's where uh, our friend Comstock will come in at some point <laughs> down the line. <laughs> but let's turn to cheerier things for uh, our, our final question here. You know, we here at Abortion Access Front, we love to celebrate providers year round every day. You know, we have this, this special week and this special day to appreciate abortion providers. What does having a, an abortion provider appreciation day mean to you and to other abortion providers? It's amazing. In my lifetime, other abortion care providers really did try to shore up these relationships between clinic staff. It could feel very lonely. Oftentimes, Stigma had shut down people who provided abortion care from talking about it as too. We have families, we have neighbors, and frankly, sometimes we just don't want to get into a political conversation when you walk into the grocery store to go buy tampons. I mean, it's like, what right. do you do? Well, I'm really not up for having that conversation with you at this moment. So having someone from the outside who works as support to us, but not necessarily someone we see all the time is a, is really special. 
because it helps remind us that it's not just the abortion care providers, that there's a whole group of people who agree and support the work that we do. And that is amazing for our staff. Many of us choose to do this work because we know it makes a difference in people's lives. And we don't do it expecting to have thank yous. They help. <laughs> they really help. But thank you so much for recognizing the work that my staff do. We love doing it. It is some of the best things that we do and one of the more delightful part of our jobs, except for the times when we get to yell at the people in front of the clinics or uh, help put them in jail. <laughs> but that's cathartic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Melissa Grant, for coming and joining us and talking with us for this abortion provider appreciation day and also for the incredible work that CARIFM does. It's so exciting to just hear from providers and hear about the way that we are all fighting to support everyone in making the reproductive choices that they need. Well, Carafem is really grateful for your broadening the information available and to know that we're providing care in every state that we possibly can, certainly in blue states, but even in states that are purple, we're continuing to try to make sure that people have access and we're not going to stop. We're not going to stop. We will keep rolling with these punches and playing this big political chess game as long as we possibly can. And my hope is that the pendulum of this adversity has swung so far that the rest of the people in the country who didn't realize it until it was too late will wake up. It doesn't have to be this way. It can be better. And the people that you love deserve it. It does. We'll make sure that links to Carafim are in our show notes and that everybody knows about how to reach you and how to find out about the incredible work that Carafim does. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you. Please take a moment to donate to Carafin, and you can follow them on socials at Carafin and help spread the word. Links will be in the show notes. And now our new favorite party game, Abortion or Distortion. <coughs> the game where you name three things and I have to guess which of two categories it falls under. What you got for me? Ooh, I'm so excited, Moji. This week, I'm asking you to guess if these are quotes from your favorite anti-vice mailman, Anthony Comstock, or one of the members of the Sopranos crime family. <laughs> it's so great for me because I didn't watch the Sopranos. <laughs> and I knew that and I have watched it too much. So I'm very excited to play this game with you. Okay, Moji, here is your first quotation. Is this quote from Anthony Comstock or one of the Sopranos? Your first quote is, for every 20 wrongs a child does, ignore 19. Well, that doesn't sound like a thing Comstock would say. He sounds like a spare the rod, beat the child kind of person. So I'm going to say it was The Sopranos. You would be correct. <laughs> that is Janice Soprano, Tony's sister. Uh, not a great mom. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your next quote. I, I want you to guess, is this quote from Anthony Comstock or one of the members of The Sopranos crime family? Your quote is... The world is the devil's hunting ground and children are his choicest game. Huh. Hmm. I'm really annoyed at the way he gendered the devil. I think she's great. <laughs> I'm going to say it's Anthony Comstock. You are correct. That is Anthony Comstock. I just think like he's thinking a little too much about hunting kids. <laughs> I feel like with that one, you know, a little devil focus for me, if I'm honest, you know, I feel like, yeah. We are at our final quotation of abortion or distortion. Is this quote from Anthony Comstock or one of the Sopranos? Your third quote is, you add up all your mortal sins and multiply that by 50. Then you add up all your venial sins and multiply that by 35. You add that together and that's your sentence. What sentence is that? <laughs> <laughs> your, your sentence in hell. Or purgatory. I'm Muslim. I don't know about any of this shit. There's too many no, levels. I'm not Christian. I'm like, you add that together. I was thinking like, oh, is that the the like, you know, the adjective and then the noun? Uh -huh. This is math. So I like math. Add up your mortal sins. Multiply the 50. Add your, and that's not, it's not Dante, right? This is not that game. Um, no, okay. this is Comstock okay. or the Sopranos <laughs> only. Those are your options. <laughs> I'm going to say Comstock. And you would be incorrect. This is Polly Walnut's Waltieri from The Sopranos. So uh, <laughs> introspective. <laughs> Good old Polly Walnut's. I knew that would be the one that would get you. I knew it. 
what an equation. <laughs> yeah, the rest of the quote, you would have absolutely known it was Pauline Walnuts because he started swearing. That was the one part I had to find quotes where people weren't swearing <laughs> about children. We know that uh, Comstock was not swearing. He was not swearing. That would be vice for sure. <laughs> Great job, Moji. You got two points and I got one. So you won this week. Thank you. I feel good about this one. I feel good. We couldn't do our work without the help of our fake sponsors. This week, we're funded by the Pregalizer 2.0. You get it. You're a cop in Idaho, Tennessee, or Amarillo, Texas, just doing your cop job, pulling over any driver who looks like they could be pregnant and leaving the state for an abortion. (gasps) Carrying a fetus across state lines? That's abortion trafficking. You know it. So now cops can pull over anyone who has that leaving the state for an abortion vibe. But vibes don't always stand up in court. Good point. So how does the Pregalizer 2.0 work? It's a breathalyzer test that women pee into. Using patented state-of-the-art wee-wee technology, law enforcement will know for sure whether persons of interest are taking an innocent drive to the next state over or a sinful trip straight to hell. The best part? The Pregalizer 2.0 detects pregnancy from the moment of conception and can tell if someone's had sex within the last 24 hours. So install the Pregalizer 2.0 and catch every pregnancy smuggler trying to leave your state. Order the Pregalizer 2.0 Law Enforcement Edition today and use the discount code MISSPISS for a free donut. The Pregalizer 2.0. Protect and serve the preborn. <laughs> that's our show thanks for listening and thanks again to melissa grant be sure to donate to care FM and follow them on social to spread the word and thank you to our very own Kristen haiti in honor of abortion provider appreciation week we are featuring aaf's adopt a clinic program it's a convenient wish list of items from independent abortion providers so you can easily send clinics exactly what they want check out adopt a clinic at aafront.org under resources and tools or click the link in our show notes and head to our socials and help us clear the abortion provider appreciation bingo board. Did we make you smarter? Make you laugh today? Show us some love by liking, subscribing, and giving us a five-star rating. Plus, stay connected with us on social media at Abortion Front across all platforms. With your help, we can get more people to learn about this assault on abortion access, and you can get involved in the fight. Looking for where you might fit in to do some abortion activism? We've got a five-part activist training series called Operation Save Abortion at OperationSaveAbortion.com. And visit our super cool activist calendar, which is full of local and national actions and educational opportunities. For example, on Abortion Provider Appreciation Day, Sunday, March 10th, from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time, Our Justice is hosting a virtual fundathon info session and training. They'll give you all the information you need to learn everything you need to know to be an all-star fundathon fundraiser. The link can be found in our activist calendar. I have had so much fun hosting the pod with you these last few weeks, Dukes. I have had a blast and I'm going to miss it so oh, much. Well, but next week, Liz will be back to host the pod with me and we'll chat with actor musician ER Fightmaster about their EP Violence, which is incredible. And we'll talk with Tanya Verja, the Equality and Feminism Minister from Catalonia, Spain. Join our Patreon. You'll support great content and get cool FBK merch and experiences. All pledges support this pod and all of our activism at Abortion Access Front. Pledge at patreon.com slash feminist buzzkills. FBK is edited by Remy D. Tournay and is produced by Abortion Access Front. Finally, we leave you with West Virginia Senator Mike Azinger, a man who's not just showing us his whole ass, he's flashing it. This is a great bill. Um, it shows conception and um, Google it. At the very nanosecond of conception, there's a flash of light. When conception occurs in human beings, I believe it's across the whole animal kingdom, at the point, the second of conception, there's a flash of light. That's God telling us, I believe. Feminist Buzzkills, the podcast from Abortion Access Front. New episodes drop Friday. When BS is popping, we pop off. And if you want to support our podcast and all the work of Abortion Access Front, like, subscribe, and join our Patreon at patreon.com slash feminist buzzkills.